it just it just goes to show you have to be kind to people and be thoughtful. And I always said, if you're kind to someone and you and you and you show them recognition, if they, I always felt, if somebody helps you, give them some recognition, acknowledge their help, because it'll come back tenfold, and it has. Somebody said, "Would you have an Axelrod story to share?" And um, Axelrod is the one who founded TFH and ran the TFH empire for 50 years or so. So I just, for those of you who aren't familiar, so. Did well, you I'm, not here, I'm not here to knock him. That wouldn't be right. The only thing I could say is that he was a generous guy, but he, he uses, he used his life in a, in a way that wasn't the best. He probably could have, uh, you know, one, he did a lot for the hobby. You can't say that he did a lot for the hobby. Yeah. He did a, you know, but he used it improperly in many ways too. He hurt a lot of people. So that's all I could say about him. I don't want to get involved. You know, he, it's it's all water over the dam. Yeah. Sam White I never want to get involved in it. The Cardinal Tetris story was, you know, fictitious, and he took credit for that, which he shouldn't have, and that should have never been named after him. So the if you don't mind, I'll just the story in the Cardinal Tetra is uh, first of all the Neon Tetra, which came out earlier, was named after Innes. Right. Um, and Axelrod wanted to be a, a bigger version of Innes, really, starting his own magazine empire. And so when the, uh, Cardinal Tetra came out, he apparently knew that Stan Weitzman was working on a description. It's a Stanford Theological Bulletin or something like that. Yeah. And uh, the day before it came out, he printed some TFH copies of one of his friends doing the publication of the Cardinal Tetra, using, calling it Axelrodi. Axelrod's name, um, which is instead of NSI for the uh, Neon Tetra. And he dated it. It's the only magazine in TFH history that was actually dated with a day of the month on it. And so it went through like a year of the theological nomenclature consortium, whatever, had to decide on it. And they decided that they would give the name to uh, TFH because they technically were released one day before the Stanford. So uh, that was one way of kind of season the, the name for himself. <laughs> yeah, he did. And it's true. That was not done. That was, I think that made a lot of people have sour grapes. You know, speaking about Ennis, I met Ennis. I was a young kid. I was about, uh, I would say I was about 26 years old, something like that. I went okay. to, because I was friends with Alan Fletcher and he was the editor of the Aquarium Magazine at the time. We were friends for over 50 years. Alan was a very nice man. And his wife was very nice as well. And he invited us to go to uh, the Aquarium Magazine. I think they were in Norristown, Pennsylvania at the time. That was a new location. And I met him, I so shook hands with him. But he was already an old man, he shuffled. And he, I shuffled better than him at his age. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Even though I'm, I'm right on his heels now, but something a lot of people didn't know for 33 years, he played the part of Ben Franklin in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. He played Ben Benjamin Franklin. He would go on the stagecoach, and they always had on Independence Day in his, and he did look like Ben Franklin. He dressed up like Ben Franklin, and he would be in a stagecoach, and they, he played the part of Ben Franklin going down in Independence Hall. Played the part of, he did it for 33 years. A lot of people don't know that. No. And it's did a lot for the hobby. He did. He did. He did. Yeah. yeah. Rosario, maybe I can prompt you with a, a safe Axelrod story. <laughs> <laughs> In the first collecting trip with him in Brazil. Yeah. And when it came time to sane for the fish. Oh, yeah. Here's a picture of him and I in a, in a book. And he's on, a, on the land and I'm in the water. And he didn't want to go in the water because he thought there was Bill Arzi in there, which is that parasitic infection. He didn't want to get it. And everybody kidded me. He said, how come you were always in the water and he wasn't? I said, well, he was afraid of Bill Harzia. I was interested in getting fish. <laughs> Forgot it. And, you know, it's that true? You? I looked at some old pictures lately, even more of that collecting trip. And there are pictures of you just soaking wet. And then there's Axarod 
dry as a bone oh. standing there <laughs> looking at the net. Yeah, I could have had a picture in here, but I, I didn't show it. I have some pictures of us together. But, you know, I, when I was with him, I liked him. I had a lot of fun with him. And he, if he liked you, he was very generous. Like I said, he just took a wrong path. If he would have stayed on a straight and narrow, he would have had, really, he would have been well-recognized and well-liked. It just, it just goes to show you have to be kind to people and be thoughtful. And I always said, if you're kind to someone and you, and you, and you show them recognition, if they, I always felt if somebody helps you, give them some recognition, acknowledge their help because it'll come back tenfold and it has. Always take time out to answer questions. I always did. I've seen some guys, they didn't want to bother to talk to a young kid. Yeah, listen, you got to take care of the young kids. They're our future. If we don't have any young kids, the hobby will be long gone. That's why I cultivate you. Look at what you turn up to be. You're, you're the best guy in the world now for a historian. There's nobody better than Bobby. If you want to know history of the hobby, talk to him. Bobby's the guy. And I'm proud of him. That's my protege. Yeah. Yeah. Mentor. Yeah. That, that's why I wanted to call out attention. <laughs> not, not protege. My men, no, I'm his mentor. Did I say that right? No, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, he's my protege. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could go back, would you do anything differently about how you approach the hobby? Yeah, I would have had a, 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 one of the new cameras after I tell you, <laughs> all the pictures I missed. Wow. You know, with the new cameras they have now, what a pleasure that would have been instead of going with the film. The film was a pain in the neck. It was a real pain with the, with the digital cameras. Boy, you could do so much. It's great. That's what I wish we had then. It would have been, I would have had tons of pictures. I had a lot of, I have a lot of pictures, but I would have had a lot more. Anything different? I don't know. I don't think so. I guess uh, I'm happy the way things turned out. Now, water conditions are kind of easy to do today. Years ago, we didn't know much about that. But today, boy, you have ion exchange resins. You have uh, RO units. And uh, you can make your water as soft as you want. Uh, you waste a lot of water with the uh, uh, RO unit, but it's a good source. The other, there's a peat filter. I used to use peat filtration for my young fish, uh, for spawning fish. The other night, I just realized I don't show the marbles on the bottom. They should have marbles first to weigh the filter down because if you sandwich the peat moss between two pieces of fiber, it has a tendency to float, even though it's been waterlogged. I waterlogged the peat. I used to boil it and then put it between two pieces of fiber, but the marbles go down in the lower part of the filter. Rosario, marbles yeah. are right there. Are they there? Can you see them? Yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. I did have them, so I guess I wasn't a dummy after all. I'm still smart, right? Okay. Anyway, that's... Oh, and I think the next slide shows you how to maintain it. If you can put that in with your young, when you set up a pair of fish with the tetras, if you look close, I had that in a woman's stocking. Those are the, uh, what you call silk stockings or whatever. Nylon? You, nylon stocking. Thanks for the word. You can put that whole thing in a nylon stocking and tie it at the top with an elastic band. Make sure that does not hit the bottom of the tank. Make sure you put it on top of a stone uh, because fry have a tendency to go under rocks. That's their strategy to stay away from predators. They go under rocks and small crevices where predators can't reach them. If that filter is too low and then it moves, it can crush my motor. First time I realized that I did that, I had about 20 or 30 fry that were stuck underneath there and were crushed. So always make sure something's underneath that filter that you maintain some kind of a space wide enough for them to go under. It's just a natural tendency for them to go into a hiding place. Okay. The peat filtration is very important because many of our fish have to have tannins in order to be have successful spawns. I mean, you can get successful spawns without it, but I'll tell you, I've been to a lot of places in Brazil where the black water is so black. If you put your hand in the water after about Four or five inches, you don't even see your hand. That's how black the water is. So tannins are very important. I can talk a little bit more about that later. 
Okay, now we go to the Nostoma Morton Thaleride. It's a very interesting pencil fish. As you know, several years ago, they came into the country and uh, uh, they went at a nice price. They go a little distance to collect them in the, uh, in the forest and they have a unique uh, finish. And I, I did an article on Pirulina spilota in 1960 for Tropicals Magazine in Chicago. And I noticed Mike is pointing to it now. You see that little appendage on the caudal? It's kind of protruding on the last fin ray of the caudal. That's called the Eurostyle. All the Pirulinas, Copellas, Copinas, Pirulinas, they all have that. They're all in the same uh, uh, family of fish. They have that unique fin ray that sticks up. And I didn't know what it was, so I, I made a little sketch and I sent it to Stan. And I said, Stan, uh, he's the curator of fishing at the Smithsonian. What is this finish? He wrote back to me, he said, you're very observant. He said, that's called the Eurostyle. And I don't know if it was Eigenman who described this fish back in the early 1900s. So they don't know what, what his purpose is. Well, I put my five power hood on and I stood there for several minutes and I kept studying them. And I noticed when they came face forward to me, that little Eurostyle would, would vibrate just like a hummingbird. It vibrated at a great pace. It would be great to take a fast action uh, camera. I mean, take a picture and find out just how many beats per second that it would beat. And that would be like a rudder. That's what helps motivate and keep that tail in balance. But it's also a tool for balance. It's like someone going across a, a wire across the waterfalls or uh, across a big gorge. And they have, what do they have? They have a big pole in their hand and they use that to balance themselves as they go across. And I think that is the same thing. I think it's a, it's a, a tool for balancing and for propelling through the water because they're too small and have, they don't have the power in the pectoral fins to, to shoot around. But after a few days, it just disappears. And I talked to Stan and I said, well, that sounds pretty good. He said, I can accept that. And that's my theory on it. 